Good morning. Glad you guys are here. So, Miss Teresa was telling us some things about these quilts. And uh, do you remember some of the things she said you could use these quilts for? What could you use a quilt for? So you could take this quilt and we could wrap it around us if we're cold, right, Natalie? Oh, where'd you go? There you are. We can wrap it around if you're cold, right? Well, you know what else you could do is that you could lift that up over there. We're going to make it, make, it, make it like a roof. Can you pick it up? Can you pick up, the, can you pick up the quilt and help me hold it up like a roof? There you go, just like that. Yeah, so we could be underneath it, almost like it's a fort, right? That'd be super cool. Or how about this? Let me see it real quick, everybody. Let me see it. I'm going to show you one more thing we can do with it, too. Let's say we all were in the same house, but we wanted to have some privacy between us. We can create a wall, and we can make a room divider with it. That's right. You know what else they could use these things for? Thank you. Thank you so much. You know what else you can use it for? You could use it for a floor. You could also put things inside of it and turn it into like a little knapsack and carry all your things with you. Like maybe you have food or you have books or you have other things. Let's sit down now. Let's sit back down. You could make it as a ghost costume as well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the, the quilted ghost. Yes. Oh, that's going to be my Halloween costume this year. Yeah, there's all kinds of things. So we're going to send these quilts everywhere. We're going to send these quilts everywhere. And do you know, like, all the places that we send these quilts to, people are going to get it. There's going to be kids that get it and adults that get it and families that get it. And do you think that, do you think we should, if, do we know if these people are good or not? If, they, if they're receiving these quilts, do we know if they're good or not? Do we know if they're good? Do, should we send them if, 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 if maybe they're not good or if they're, maybe they're bad or maybe they're good? Should we still send them? Why, why, why should we send them, I mean, even if some of those people maybe are not nice all the time? That's a hard question, isn't it? Maybe they need something that can help them be warmer, and we are supposed to help no matter what, and it doesn't matter if somebody's good or not, because let me ask you this, is anybody in here perfectly good? Just raise your hands if you've never done anything wrong. Go ahead. Nobody's raising their hand. Oh, you guys. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and I'm sure we all believe you, yes. Uh, so there isn't really anybody that's done everything good, but how do we know how to do this? How do we know how to send something to somebody even though maybe they're not always good all the time? Does anybody else do that for us? Because that's the way that God loves us. We've been given this wonderful example that no matter what we do or who we are or what we say or even what, who we're related to or what relationships we have, God send us Jesus, and God loves us all the time. Just the same way that we send quilts to anybody with any need, no matter who they are, or where they're from, or what their needs are. Let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, for teaching us how to love one another, no matter where we come from, what language we speak, or our relationship status. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So our gospel today points out a very contentious uh, concept and something called divorce. And we're going to talk about that. And, and, and believe you me, I'd much rather preach on quilts right now. Um, but we're going to actually talk about this. Um, and, and before we get into our gospel lesson and even our Old Testament lesson, because they are both related to this, um, let's just make sure that we're all in the same place. This topic of divorce and these, these lessons, these very lessons have been used in the past to cause a lot of damage uh, to make people feel guilty, to make people feel shame, um, and that's not what we're going to do today. Um, a lot of times we read scripture from our 21st century eyes, and uh, we forget that this was written for a certain people at a certain time in a certain context. And I think once we start reading it that way, we might discover some really, really good news, because divorce has touched everybody. I've done premarital counseling for almost 20 years as a, uh, uh, as a pastor, and Every couple that comes in, we work through their history, their family history, and not a single couple has not had one aspect of divorce in their life. Um, there are people in here that have been divorced. There are people that are going through divorce. Uh, there are people that are contemplating divorce. There are people that are, have never been married. There are people that have been married 70 years or 70 minutes. This, there is good news in this lesson for all. So let's take a look at it, shall we? In the Old Testament lesson today... Um, God is, is, is talking to or, or, or doing some things with the first man. This is the second story of creation. Now, creation stories, uh, there's two of them in our Bible, and um, they're commonly known as Midrash, uh, which is a telling. 
uh, which is to explain what happened in the New Testament. We have parables. Uh, in the Old Testament, they have something called the Midrash. So when some, like a child says, where did we come from? They would do the creation story. They would do this telling to explain where God was in all this and that God is in the middle of it. So we're in the second story of creation, and God has already created the first man and then recognizes this man needs a helper. And so God says, I'm going to give you all these animals so maybe you can find a helper among them. Name them all. And so the man starts to name them. You're going to be goat. You're going to be pig. You're going to be cat. You're going to be unicorn. I'm just kidding. Yes. Uh, and, then, um, and then afterwards, there was no helper to be found. Before we go any further, that word helper is a pretty important thing. Because in our 21st century mindset, I, I hear the word helper and I think of me being like a kindergarten teacher, and Tommy's going to be my helper for the day, and Tommy's going to pass out the glue, and Tommy's going to collect all the papers, and Tommy's going to get to move the clips on the board. Tommy's going to be the first in line. Tommy, you're the helper today. I'm the helper. But Tommy is part of an authoritative structure, right? Where I have all the power, and Tommy has no power, right? That's our concept today of this aspect of a helper, I think, a lot of times. But in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, when the word helper is used outside of this lesson right here, it's always describing God's character. And when it describes God's character, it's as if God is a rescuer. And it's the same uh, Hebrew word that's used for rescue. So God, in the story of creation, is looking for someone to rescue the first person from solitude. We're made to live in community. Not so that somebody comes to be underneath this person as some sort of subject to help but one to work with. And so God names the first person, and the name is Adam, uh, which literally means earth, dirt, dust, and then pulls, causes this sleep to come over this, this first person, and then pulls out a rib, and then creates this woman. And this woman's name in the Hebrew is best to be described as life giver, spirit, breath. And so God says that these two will become one flesh. Now, a lot of times that concept of one flesh is used to talk about procreation, and yes, it is, and you can talk about that, but it also means a mutual loyalty, that they are now one, and that this dust, dirt, earth is now with this living, life-bearing spirit. Does that remind you of anything else? It's a beautiful image of creation, right? And that they are one, and what God has joined together no one could possibly separate this. And if you keep reading in Genesis, the next line says, and they both realized that they were naked and they were not afraid. And at this point in time, this is paradise. This is perfection. This is God creating something for us to go and co-create and continue to create together with mutual loyalty where I'm looking out for the good for you and you're looking out for the good for me and we're working together. Okay, so that's... Genesis text. Jesus is going to quote this in a minute, so we're going to come back. The Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus because he's been named the Messiah by others, and they're really concerned about job security because if he comes in, he's going to overthrow their, 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 their top of the pyramid, you know, and he's going to take charge of the temple, and where are they going to be? And so they're really not wanting him to do this because things are going pretty good for them right now, and please don't ruin this for us, Jesus. And so they try to trap him, and they said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus, the good rabbi, responds with a question. Well, what does Moses say? Well, Moses says you can write a letter certificate of dismissal and divorce her. And Jesus reminds them why Moses wrote this. It's because of their hardness of heart. So let's just pause for a second and kind of talk about that. Anytime you hear the word hardness of heart, if you're like me, you think of Pharaoh. I think of the Exodus story. Pharaoh's heart was hard and would not open himself up to what God was asking him, and then plague after plague would happen. And I preached on this a while back and talked about this hardness of heart is really just another word for selfish, self-centered. I, I, I refuse to change. No, this is how it's supposed to be. This is how I want it to be, and I will not look at it from any other direction. So hardness of heart is this unwillingness to change. So Moses is now in the, in the wilderness with all of the Israelites, and they, too, have this hardness of heart, this aspect of selfishness. They've just received all the commandments. And among those commandments, 
Or remember, the commandments are all about our relationships, relationships with God and relationships with each other. And among those commandments are a few key ones that have to deal with our lesson today. One is, thou shall not murder, thou shall not commit adultery, and thou shall not covet anything. And so Moses is recognizing something pretty dire. The men in the wilderness would dismiss their wife so they could take on another wife. Now, on its face value, that seems like something that should be an okay thing for people to possibly do. However, at the time, if you're going to dismiss a woman that's still married to you back then, that woman then would have to just wander off by herself and try to figure it all out. In other words, she was basically, it was giving her a death sentence. She would wander off to die. And the reason why the guy might want to d dismiss this woman could be for any reason. Maybe she's not able to produce a male heir. Maybe she can't have children at all. Maybe he doesn't like the way she cooks. It doesn't make a difference. He had the ability to just dismiss her. So Moses is seeing this thing happen and recognizes that there's some injustice happening here. And I would love to think that Moses was altruistic and just loved women and wrote this to be to make sure that they were protected. I'm sure there was a little piece of that in there. However... What Moses saw was people breaking the commandments, and they were breaking covenantal law, and they were no longer in this right relationship with God or with each other. And so in a, kind of a sense to circumvent that, Moses created this letter of dismissal to divorce someone. So that way then this woman was not cast off to die, but then in, could enter into another relationship or another family or another unit or another caregiver. In other words... There wasn't anybody to be murdered in this sense. Um, and nobody was going to die in this adultery. So they had this hardness of heart even then. So the Pharisees are asking Jesus about this, and he reminds them of their selfish behavior. And why this was written in the first place is because we have the inability to live in a loving, mutual relationship with each other. And then he quotes Genesis. From the beginning, a man will leave his mother and his father and cling to his wife, and they will become one flesh. It will be unified in what God joins together. No one can separate this beautiful thing whenever two have come together with mutual loyalty to each other. That can't be separated there. And then he pulls in the disciples into his home. And he says some things that forever have been used since then to really destroy people. And he says, if a man leaves his wife and, and marries another, he commits adultery. And if a woman leaves, divorces her husband and she marries another, she commits adultery. Now, on its face value, if we were going to read this literally, it's a hard thing for us to read. But when we start thinking about the time frame that this was written and what Jesus is saying, at this, at this point in time, women in the Jewish law were not able to divorce their husband. So it wasn't even a potential for them to do so. So what Jesus is doing is open this up to mutuality of recognizing that we are all messed up in this world and that we all play a part in this. And that we are all seeking our own selfish ways and our selfish gains. We all have this sense of this hardness of heart. Can we see that? Can we see that there's this better way of being with each other with mutual joy? And then people will start bringing children to Jesus. And the disciples, with their own hardness of heart, start to usher them away. Get out of here, kids. We're busy. Go. And Jesus says, let them come to me. Because that's the kingdom of God. Remember, children at this point in time, they were the lowest rung on the ladder. And if a man did not want that child because it, maybe it was a girl or maybe they were dealing with some sort of deformity or something, that they could just leave them out to be taken out with the Monday morning trash. And Jesus is collecting these most vulnerable among them. And he's laying his hands on them and blessing them. And he says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Unless you can enter it like this vulnerable child, you're just not going to get it. And in fact, you're not going to even receive it right now. It's available to us right now. That this vulnerable child and that this, that this woman that's been dismissed, that's the kingdom of God. Can you see it? Can you see it? This past week, I've had multiple conversations with people. One that let me know that the divorce was final. Another one that told me that they're getting ready to file. Another one that's caught up in a very ugly custody battle. And still another one that three weeks after the divorce was final was calling to touch base to tell me how they're doing. It's real. 
It's here. It's a part of who we are. And just because that mutual relationship, that loyalty that maybe happened at the beginning, all of a sudden you recognize that it's not working anymore, it doesn't mean that you're broken or bad or sinful because that's not what Scripture's telling. It's inviting us to discover this mutual joy, and that may not be with the person that you're married with anymore. And that's okay if that's the case. But there are others to create that with. Maybe it's the family that you were born into. Maybe it's the family you were adopted into. Maybe it's the family you were married into. Maybe it's the family of choice in your coworkers or your friend group. Maybe it's your pets. Whatever that case might be, there's an opportunity for us to practice this sense of mutual joy, that one flesh aspect where dust and spirit are all come together and we become co-creators yet again. We don't get this perfect because we all have that sense of that hardness of heart and we all seek our own ways sometime. But are we able to come back to that? And if the relationship can't last, then maybe it goes on to dissolve and goes on to a different relationship. But that doesn't mean that you are damned for all time or that you're not going to get into heaven or that you're a sinner. None of that means that because there's nothing that we can say that's going to save us. There's nothing that we can do that's going to save us. And by the way, there's nothing that we can say that's not going to save us or not going to get us into heaven. There's not a relationship status on Facebook that we can put to make sure that I'm okay and that God's going to receive me. Because the truth of the matter is that when our time on earth is done and we turn back to the dust, our spirit, our life, our, our, our life force, that whatever it goes on, I think at that point in time it meets our beloved Savior whose life, death, and resurrection has saved us. And we become that vulnerable child and we are seen fully in that moment, and we are received into the loving arms of God who has loved us from the beginning of creation, wanting us in this perfect co-creating community of love, of mutual loyalty with one another. So today, maybe if just for today, we take it easy on each other because we don't know who's dealing with what. We don't know what relationships somebody has or what struggle they're going through in their marriage, or maybe they're single, or maybe they've been married for 70 years or 70 minutes. We don't know. But what we can do is try to practice that sense of seeing the good in you and doing good for you and trying to receive the same thing back and live in that place of mutual loyalty. Amen.